Well, today when we're acknowledging the gift of life in many forms, we'll just acknowledge uh, Kathleen had her birthday yesterday. So how grateful we are for, for the, all you bring to your family and, and uh, the world through us and your service. Let's pause for a prayer. Let's pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and useful to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to tell you why this is an unusual sermon for me to do. Um, I've never done a sermon on this topic before, but it's because I'm here at Summerlin that I'm doing this sermon. Uh, on the last Sunday of May, it was Bart's last Sunday, my wife and I came to be part of the service, and this was all full in here. So we sat out on the patio off to that edge by the street, and um, we were watching the service on the monitor and then sometimes looking down here. And then occasionally I look up and say, wow, there's the Pacific Ocean. What a backdrop for a worship service. And the Sundays since I've been here, I drive down the 101, and I look, and I go, wow, there's the Pacific Ocean. I get to see it on my way to work. And when we're all done, when I'm done here, greeting people, chit-chatting, whatever, and turn and start to go down the street to where my car's parked, I go, wow, there's the Pacific Ocean right, right here. For one thing, it reminds me of being in Galilee. If you've been to Israel, you've been to the northern sea of Galilee, where the Mount of the Beatitudes uh, is and um, the um, places where tradition has it that Jesus taught. It was on hillsides, the Sea of Galilee behind, hillsides that share a similar ecology to where we are here. And the Sea of Galilee isn't quite as big as the Pacific Ocean, but it's a background of blue that's limitless on the horizon. So for those reasons, I felt like, you know, I believe that wherever we're living, we should know where we're living and be embodied there. So I think I'm gonna take this week and think about what does it mean to be by this ocean? And so the thoughts I've put together, I'm just calling, behold, the sea. So I'm gonna start with just a few verses from Psalm 104. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about interpretation and a little bit about the role of the sea in, in Scripture, and then come back to the psalm and kind of dig into it a bit for what I think it's relevant to for our lives and our future. Psalm 104, I mean, it's good to remember these psalms, these poems, these songs, these Hebrew songs, this was written 2,500 years ago. And yet when I hear it and read it, it feels like it was written this morning. Uh, at least the way it speaks. It begins, um, Praise the Lord, my soul. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of the upper chambers on their waters. This is kind of this setting this whole stage. The part we're going to come back to, verse 24. How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things, both great and small. And there the ships go to and fro, and Leviathan, who you, who you formed to frolic there. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. So, I want to get into this psalm, but I want to say a little bit of interpretation, a little bit of aside about how to interpret, I think, texts that have to do with creation in modern times. In the congregations I've served over the years, I've often found there's a range of people who views on many different topics that are important to us in faith. Uh, one of them has to do with traditionally talking about creationism and science and that whole debate that's been going on for a couple hundred years. And um, 
I've seen and known good people of all perspectives on that topic. And what I've often said is, I'm going to invite everybody, no matter what your perspective is, to join together in looking for the sole meaning of the text. The sole meaning of the text. Back when I started seminary, more than 40 years ago, um, one of the first people we heard as incoming class, uh, class women and men was Bruce Metzger, who um, uh, uh, other students said, there's Dr. Metzger. He wrote the Bible. And I didn't quite understand it, but the new Revised Standard Version had just come out, and if you opened it, that was our textbook in the early 80s. Bruce Metzger, chief editor. So he'd overseen all the translation of the Old Testament, all of the New. And uh, he was a very quiet, wonderful, gentle, devoted guy. And he gave an introductory talk to the incoming class people. And one thing he said that stuck with me, he said, when it comes to interpretation, always look for the core meaning. He said, in Gospel of Mark, when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God is like a, a, a mustard seed, Jesus says the mustard seed is the smallest seed in the kingdom. And Dr. Mesker said, well, botanically, we know now there are smaller seeds than the mustard seed. But Jesus wasn't giving a lecture in botany. He was speaking to the, the farmers and the, the people, the rural people that he did his ministry with, with images they could understand. And the smallest seed they knew was the mustard seed. But the point, again, wasn't botany. It was the wonder of the kingdom of God. And taking something that they knew and, and using it as a parable to explain a deep, abiding, amazing biblical truth is what the Bible is all about. So um, that's the way I approach it. Whatever your perspective uh, might be, let's look for the sole meaning of these texts. Uh, love is spoken here at Summerlin, and so if you have different perspectives, I love to hear them. But just invite you to come along with me as we look at this psalm. Now the section I've chosen about this psalm is a lot about the sea, and I took some time recently to think about, just very briefly, think about the role of the sea in the Bible. And there's a lot there. The opening chapter of Genesis has a number of references to the sea. It was understood after light and separated from darkness. It was this, the sea and the, and the separation to the heavens and then the dry land and everything that emerges from that. Think about Noah. and The sea is really used to clean, cleanse the earth after human beings have, have, have been doing uh, um, poorly at managing their affairs. The most pivotal act in the history of, this, of the people of Israel is the parting of the Red Sea, where the people come from freedom to, to I mean, from bondage to freedom and liberation. And we got the story of Jonah. Uh, the people of Israel were not sailors. The Phoenicians and the Greeks and those folks were the sailors. The people of Israel were land people, but they could glimpse they could glimpse the ocean and they heard stories and they would know things and so the scripture speaks through what they knew about the wonders of the sea. And you think about when Jesus starts his ministry, he's moving along the shores of the Sea of Galilee when he calls the first disciples. And when he's in Capernaum and a lot of his early ministry, it's like I said, it's the, the Sea of Galilee, the biggest body of water that was in that area. That was the background for a lot of it. And then it wasn't until this, this winter, um, personally, I'm trying to do some things that I've always wanted to do in my life but never had time, and one of them was to take sailing lessons, because I, I love the ocean, but I've never learned to sail. So I signed up to the Santa Barbara Sailing Center and, and took the lessons, and I haven't sweated a multiple choice test in years as much as I sweated trying to get the passing grade on the sailing test. But spending some time out there on the sailing uh, channels and with the sailboat, learning some of the, the vocabulary, I thought, what about sailing in scripture? So I looked into it, and I was astounded to find Acts 27. If you, ever, if you have an interest in sailing or anything, read Acts 27. It's about Paul's amazing journey in the Mediterranean, and it's all these sailing terms about the wind going this way, and they had to go leeward of Crete, and they had to find the right kind of waters and look for the right kinds of signs. And I thought, I never realized that that sailing was so much a part of it. So we could go on, but water, the sea, the background of the sea, the symbolism and the creation, all of that is fundamental, I think, to an understanding of scripture. Behold the sea. 
Now let's turn to Psalm 104. As I mentioned, uh, we had our worship team meeting at mid midweek, our staff meeting, and uh, when I introduced this psalm, uh, I mentioned that Psalm 104 had, has come into a lot of prominence in recent decades. Uh, when I was in the 80s, first starting in my ministry, um, and really it was, it was coming into the foreground as the church and people of faith started to seek to understand and be part of the environmental movement. So Psalm 104, if we look at it, it mentions all these different aspects of creation. It talks about the upper chambers. I'm going to be skipping around the whole thing, so you go home and read it, but the clouds of the chariot, the wind, the fire. God makes springs pour water into ravines that flows between the mountains. Those rivers and waters give, give water to the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the sky nest by the waters, and they sing among the branches. God waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The land is satisfied with the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle, plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. The trees of Lebanon are well watered, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. <clears throat> there the birds make their nest. The stork has its home in the junipers. The high mountains belong to the wild goats. The crags are a refuge for the hyrax, and there's the moon, and it goes on and on. So one thing about it, 35 verses, and only six have anything to do with human beings. 29 of those verses of Psalm 104 are focused on what we might call the whole world ecosystem, the sky and, and the earth and the waters, and how it's all integrated, how it's all full of wonders. And people are mentioned, we, we rise up and do our work, and then we come home in the evening to rest. But so is the stork and the badger and all kinds of creatures. So it's an incredible, comprehensive vision of the unity and complexity and wonder of life that God has, has brought into existence. Now, coming to focus very specifically on, on the part about the sea. Uh, and in your bulletin, if you're here with us in, uh, in person, Printed some of that, uh, that newer international version, and then on the other side of that is uh, Eugene Peterson's The Message version, which puts it in a very contemporary kind of paraphrasing. And I invite you to take it home and look at it and, and see. Um, it's interesting to compare them. <clears throat> Hebrew poetry is very, um, very rich, and it's not easy to translate uh, directly. So you see a lot of different interpretations of it. Um, but I'm going to go with it. New International is the main, um, the main kind of uh, version for today. So, verse 24. <clears throat> How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and Leviathan, whom you formed to frolic there. Okay, so let's start with, there is the sea, vast and spacious. I went to the National Geographic website, article on the ocean, and did my research this week. 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by the sea. And 97% of the water on the Earth is out there in the ocean. 97% of the water. With all the amazing expansion of satellites and all kinds of technology, 80% of the sea is still unmapped. Only 20% of it is, is really understood and, and, and known uh, in, in any adequate way. 80% of it is still kind of a mystery. So talk about there's the sea, vast and spacious. It's so true. It's teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. According to the National Geographic, uh, the number of uh, species out in the sea, 260,000. That's not creatures, that's species. 260,000 different kinds of creatures that have come into existence by the, by the grace of God. And they're both large and small. Let me tell you about a large one that I got to spend time with this week. On Monday, we um, were taking care of our grandsons, and we wanted to go to the Natural History Museum because, as you know, they have a, may know, they have a new exhibit on crystals, and one of our grandsons loves crystals and rocks, and also butterflies. 
So we went there and we parked, we got there early and we were all going in, but old Pop Pop got stuck at the whale. Because I've seen that whale skeleton in front of the Natural History Museum for 30 years, but for some reason this week, I, st I read what it was there and I stood there and just tried to think about this whale skeleton. Now apparently, the nickname for it is Chad, because Chad Dreyer was a, f a very generous donor here in town, and he helped fund uh, that, that exhibit at the Natural History Museum. But as you may know, <coughs> um, that whale skeleton washed up off of Vandenberg in 1980. And that skeleton is 72 feet long. And I asked Peter, how, how long is our sanctuary? He said about 35 feet. So a fully grown blue whale would be twice the size of our sanctuary. It weighs 7,700 pounds, or it weighed before it was a skeleton. And it would eat, well, it does eat, the blue whales out there, 40 million krill a day. That's almost as much as an NFL lineman. You know, that's... Now, just think about that. And Chad is an adolescent, not even a fully grown whale. 72 feet long, 7,700 pounds, 40 million krill daily. And that's what, in biblical times, they called Leviathan. And as you may know, in other creation stories of the ancient Near East, there were stories of, of these <coughs> um, creatures and gods battling things out. <coughs> and Leviathan was often a uh, kind of a sea dragon <coughs> that had to be defeated. But not in, the, not, not in, not in Israel's understanding of creation and, and God as creator. One creator through all of creation. And Leviathan <clears throat> wasn't something to be feared because God created Leviathan to sport, to frolic. Maybe whales can be a scary thing. But the biblical understanding was that whale plays, it frolics. Now how true is that to our contemporary knowledge of the way whales, and dolphins, and all those kinds of amazing creatures interact. And they sing to each other and their family relationships and all the things they do. One of the gifts by, that we have of living so close is to see all those creatures at different times. And this channel that we live behind, that we're right next to, those blue whales, are, they circulate annually along with all these other creatures. So talk about that, just those few verses. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and Leviathan whom you formed a frolic there. Now I'll note that uh, Eugene Peterson in the message adds, uh, he's got his phrase, oh look, the deep wide sea brimming with fish past counting, sardines and sharks and salmon. <clears throat> now, sardines and sharks and salmon weren't part of the original Hebrew literally, but I think Gene Peterson was trying to make it relevant to us of these different sizes. I'll just say as an aside that for the last several years, my wife and I have been part of a or local organization called Get Hooked, which is a cooperative between the commercial fishermen in the Santa Barbara Harbor and the UCSB Marine Fisheries and Sustainable Ecology uh, Department. And together they cooperate on, on bringing uh, seafood to the local community and so every week we get it, we pay a monthly fee and we get a little share once a week. And not only do we get a share of local seafood, but we get articles or videos about where it came from, who the fishing family was that brought it. Why is this a sustainable species? And sometimes you get some really cool stuff like king salmon, which has recently been running here in the channel. And sometimes we get things that kind of stretch our imagination a little bit. We haven't been used to doing our own mussels or squid very much. We try things, but it's informative. But it makes you appreciate the diversity of it all and the importance of being a steward. So, the vastness of the sea, the things, great and small, that are there, from the krill to the whale. How can we not be filled with wonder and awe? If Psalm 104 has one abiding purpose for human, humanity is not only just to um, be part of our own livelihood, but also to be the voice of wonder and praise for the creator who brings it all into existence and sustains it all. 
Behold, the sea. And just a final word about responsibility. As we know in the great Genesis story, uh, at, the, at, the, at the completion of the, of the creation time, human beings, male and female, are given the job of being stewards of the earth. Little could people two and a half thousand years ago imagine how important that, that, that message to us is in our own time. As we know, so much of our, of our world is being threatened in a lot of ways. We have friends who are researchers at UCSB that just study the Coral Sea, both in the Red Sea and in, in Australia, the, the coral and how it's disappearing and what could be done to save it. When I lived in, we lived in rural Washington, people on farms used to have to borrow each other's equipment at times, but there was always an unwritten rule when you borrowed somebody else's tool, you always brought it back in at least as good a condition as you borrowed it. I think that's pretty simple wisdom of how to get along in the world. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's not ours. A lot's been done. People didn't realize for so long what had been done. But we have a chance now to try to fulfill that stewardship role, to be stewards of this incredible creation that God has given us the gift of living in. 1972, brown pelicans were almost extinct. And it turned out it was DDT that was, we were using the best of our knowledge, but it got into the ecosystem, ended up making their shells, their eggshells fragile, and they almost went extinct like the bald eagle. But I spent a lot of time at Goleta Beach, out at Campus Point, and there are flocks of brown pelicans now. And every time I look at them, I think this is a sign of hope. It's like the dove for Noah's Ark. Those brown pelicans are like, we made a change in how we are being stewards of the earth. And now these God-given creatures live. Behold the sea. Let us give praise and thanks to God. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. And let us also find the task we need to do to help honor the creator who made it all care for this glorious creation that we have the privilege of living in. Let us pray. God, what a gift you have given us to even begin to comprehend the majesty and complexity and splendor, interrelatedness of your creation. Help us always be in awe. Help us always be ready to sing your praise. Help us always be ready to give you the glory. And help us also to be ready to do what we need to do to preserve and protect it. This we pray in the one who was Lord of the waves, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures Evolving in pursuit of what you said If it all reveals your nature so much I can see your heart in everything you say Every painted sky and canvas of your Let's sing our choral benediction.
we've been given so many gifts and blessings. Gift of salvation, gift of the Spirit, gift of the church. And we get to be part of this credible gift of the creation. Let us give thanks to God for the creation with all our breath. And let us be committed to always preserve and protect it to the glory of God. And may we continue in our day-to-day lives and work focused on and drawn by and upheld by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Creator, and the presence of the life-giving Spirit. Amen.